Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. How Lakeland and Millington schools are dealing with coronavirus tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us as we continue to do the show remotely. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Bo Griffin, Superintendent of Millington Municipal Schools. Bo, thanks for being here. Eric, thanks for having me. Along with uh, Ted Horrell, the Superintendent of Lakeland School System. Ted, thanks for joining us. Pleasure, thank you. And Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. Um, I will note to, to uh, people viewing that uh, over the past month or so, we've had the superintendents now with, with Ted and Bo of all the, the suburban and school systems, as well as uh, Shelby County Schools. Um, all those conversations are available on WKNO.org or as podcasts on the Daily Memphian site or wherever you get your podcasts. And um, obviously, uh, and I'll start with you, Bo, um, you know, schools have been one of the front lines, obviously, of coronavirus and the huge impact it has had on us, both as, boy, you know, how we live economically, uh, working parents. I mean, it's just, it's just, the, and the risks and health, not, 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 not the least of which that. Um, what, I guess, let's start with a question I've asked all the superintendents so far, and I'll, I'll ask this of Ted as well. What does a typical day look like uh, for Millington School uh, staff? and um, the, the, the kids. And let me say for people who may be not familiar that you have about 2,500 uh, students in your- Yes, sir, that's correct. Or three, uh, what, four schools, two elementary schools, a middle school and a high school. But what, yep. what does a typical day look like for you? Well, we're on the hybrid schedule. So we have students have uh, chosen in-person learning and also virtual learning. Uh, about 40% of our students chose the all virtual route. So basically school day is uh, very similar uh, it would be as normal, except we only have about 60% of our, our students on campus at our facilities. Uh, it's a very trying time because this is a situation we could not just, you know, pull education 101 off the shelf and use that plan to answer the questions that we're dealing with right now. But, you know, our teachers have done an amazing job. Uh, our students have more than done what we've asked of them, but especially our, our community. Our community has come together and really supported us in these, these times of uncertainty. But, you know, we're just doing everything we can and make sure that we give our children the best opportunity to be educated yeah. in these troubling times. Have you had, I imagine, I mean, everyone's had cases in some level. Have you had many cases? Um, what, what, how has that worked so far in terms of students or staff testing positive? Well, we, we've had a few cases, yes, sir. Uh, one of the things is that all the cases have come from outside into the school. Uh, for example, a student goes to a, uh, a birthday party and then they find out that somebody is, has been uh, tested positive for the virus or if they have been uh, outside of their home or situations or at ball games or they're all kinds of family events. Uh, it's been very difficult. Uh, we're just trying to control what we can control, and that's what we can control is our environment at school. Uh, our facilities manager, Mr. Phil LeBlanc, and all our leadership in the building have done a great job of following the three golden rules of COVID. You know, with the, we mask up, we keep six foot apart personally and social distancing, and we wash our hands at least five to six times a day. And our our cleaning crews are wiping down touch points during throughout the day, and the teachers. Uh, you know, I joke about this, but I didn't know you could buy hand sanitizer and 55 gallon drums, but we have four, <laughs> we have four of those uh, on campus for our teachers. So we're, you know, doing everything we can to try to negate as much as possible the virus. But once again, everybody has, it's been a team effort and just very, very proud of the effort so far. And we'll dig into some of those questions further, but I want to bring Ted in. And same thing, I assume um, you, you have about 1900 students. Um, you've got an elementary school, a middle school and a high school under construction. Um, the, uh, but how, do, for the, 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 the two schools that are open, um, what does it look like to parents and staff? Sure. It's a little different from the elementary to the middle school at the elementary school. Um, the students for the most part, it probably feels a lot more, at least like regular school in that, uh, the classroom sizes allowed us to get, uh, 
class sizes that were fairly close to what we normally would, a little bit smaller. Uh, the main thing is we have a lot less circulation in the building than we typically would. So teachers come to the students, the students eat lunch uh, and breakfast in the classrooms. Um, so we're trying to minimize that transition between classes. And, and let me interrupt you. I'm sorry, Ted, just because it's, it is heavy on people who are obsessed with this. And many of us are. It's in fact, circulation, you mean the, the movement of students, not the circulation of air, because circulation Thank of you. air is obviously uh, a huge yes, thing. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, circulation of air is something we do take seriously, but we're trying to minimize the circulation of students, gotcha. uh, certainly maximize the circulation of air, uh, just so there's fewer potential for contacts. And that's that's worked well for us. We actually, uh, in, our, in our two schools to date, uh, I, I kind of check my phone every time I say this, we have not had one student case to date, uh, and we have had one uh, staff member case that was a, a home contact that we believe um, right. caused that. At the middle school, um, we basically the students are in regular classrooms three days a week, and then two days a week they do most of their work um, in, in, through digital applications or, or pull out where they do some of their specialty classes that way. So it's a bit like a hybrid schedule, but they're still at school doing it. And then for the second nine weeks, we actually gave parents the option of letting their students do that work at home. So they're in school three days a week and uh, work at home two days a week. Okay, let me, uh, we'll come back to a bunch of that, uh, but uh, let me bring in Bill Dries. Um, let's talk about testing a little bit. Testing comes up as, as a priority and then it will, will recede a bit in, in the public discussions of this. Um, Bo, in, in terms of the logistics of it, uh, testing for students, testing for staff, what do you think that that looks like if if that comes about in your school system? Well, that's a question that's been brought up, and it's a one of the issues, of course, is going to be the finance behind it. You know, the cost. I know that for us, we've used a lot of our CARES Act money to go directly into the classroom and into the safety of our students and staff being here. Uh, you know, it's a situation where I will take it to our board. I also uh, take it to our community and our stakeholders because it's not just uh, a situation where I can say, okay, we're going to do this and then everybody's going to take the test. It's still going to have a lot of input and a lot of uh, questions to be asked before we can do something like that. Mm -hmm. Would it be useful? Uh, from all the data, I, I could see that it could be, but I could also see where parents would refuse to do that uh, with their students. I understand that as well. I'm a parent as well. I've got a nine-year-old in our school district, uh, but it's a situation where it's going to be, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to do what's best for our students and also what we can legally for our students as well. Mm -hmm. Ted, it, this is kind of like balancing a number of balls in the air. What, what happens when you throw testing into it in, in your school system? Well, we've only recently uh, kind of been involved in conversations about what they call assurance testing or asymptomatic testing. And I think there, there are certainly a number of advantages, uh, certainly some considerations, as Bo mentioned, the, the financial consideration and the logistics of it. Uh, it, it really, as, my, as I understand, it largely depends on having you know, the entirety of a group of students, be that a cohort or a pod or, or whatever they call it, be willing to participate. If you don't have that, then I think it probably reduces the, uh, the effectiveness of it pretty significantly. And our understanding is right now it would be voluntary if we asked, uh, certainly if we asked students to do it. Uh, teachers would be probably a different situation. And, and we're, we're, we're going to talk to some of the uh, private schools that have been involved in the local pilots of this and, and get some more information about it. Mm -hmm. it is, is that something that allows you kind of long-term planning for this? Uh, does, it, does it make the future a bit more certain if you can have that assurance that, that would come if you can work out the testing? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, so far, like I said, in our case, we, we feel like our strategy has been pretty good. Um, the, the fact that, that we haven't had any student cases, we know it's a matter of time. Um, and, and basically, we just stick to those principles. We're very, very strict about the six feet of social distancing, and we're very strict about masking. And we feel like that's been uh, uh, certainly key to the success. And I, I feel like that's probably the most important two elements along with, you know, sanitation and, and cleaning of the buildings. But, um, you know, we, we feel like we, we hope it's not uh, too much longer, obviously, but we feel like we could continue on this pace pretty reasonably uh, doing the things that we're doing now. 
Mm -hmm. um, Bo, it, it, with the uh, youngest students, um, how does this work? Is, is this the only normal that they've really known if they're, if they're new to school? And is maybe the transition a bit more difficult for the older kids who, who have a prior experience with, with school? Well, we try to help out our younger students because our, our pre-K through second grade, they're going four days a week. So to try to build that norm. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to teach a child how to, how, how to read on an iPad, you know, you know, pre-K through grade three, you really are learning how to read. And then fourth grade until you graduate and the rest of your life, you read to learn. So it's very important that we have that one-on-one -on -one with them. So we brought those students in to work with those literacy skills and basic fundamental math skills as well. So, uh, it's a situation where their norm right now, if we brought them back two days a week, it would be very difficult when we went to five days a week with them when, when the Shelby County Health Department lets us do that. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, there is no such thing as a new norm. <laughs> uh, this mm -hmm. thing changes not day, day by day, but hour to hour. As Dr. Horrell said, I think it's a very good point. Uh, we are constantly making adjustments and we're constantly collaborating with our, our the Shelby County Health Department, our city leaders, uh, our building leaders, our, our nurses in our in our classes in our in our schools. So we're constantly trying to reevaluate and do what we can. But the number one priority is to keep our students and our staff safe. Ted, mm -hmm. so, so same question. How does this uh, how, how does this work with the youngest students? The um, you know that that's probably the group that's that's most critical. I think as we as we know to get that in person learning. In fact, we did some. Uh, we, we do some testing at the start of the year um, that's more formative testing, benchmark testing. And what we found uh, fairly, you know, surprisingly is that we didn't really see a big difference between where our K-8 students started this year versus where they started last year in terms of this kind of uh, benchmark testing with the exception of first and second grade. Those were the two areas where we, we saw more fall off that I, I think could, you know, reasonably be linked to, um, not being in school the last nine weeks of the last year. So uh, we're definitely, we, we promised parents we were gonna meet the kids uh, where they were when they got here and that's what our teachers are doing. And um, we, we do feel like it, it is an advantage to have especially those younger grades in person. We've got them five days a week, uh, you know, if, if that's the option that the parents chose uh, and, and we feel like that's been best for them in our case. Eric? Yep, I wanted to go back to one thing, uh, Bo, that you said about testing. Um, that you, it sounds like you've heard from, I don't want to put words in your mouth, you've heard from some students, not students, some uh, uh, parents and community members who really wouldn't want to do regular testing. Wh why is that? Because I think some people hear that and think, wow, if I could get tested on a regular basis and it was easy and I'd love that. And I, I get that that's not everyone's response, but could you elaborate a little bit about, on the feedback you're getting from people who say, I, I'm not sure I want that kind of testing? Yeah, Eric, I mean, that just goes back to the, the sense that, you know, Students and parents have rights, and you know we cannot just mandate that they all take a, the assurance testing. Uh, like Dr. Horrell said earlier, we have just recently been in conversation with moving forward. Uh, of course, there's a lot of data out there that is saying that it can be very effective. I I have seen where at the university level, once again, it's a little different because they are adults; they can make a choice on whether they want to take that test or not. But it's just a very uh, the legality of it is the issue more than anything gotcha. else. Because we don't want to step on the HIPAA or of the FARPA rights of our students. And that's yeah. a major issue right there. Um, if you, you talked about money and I mean, you know, again, this, the, all these things you're talking about from the 55 gallon drums of, uh, yes, of hand sanitizer to everything is, is these costs, these things cost money. If you could, this is a silly question on some level. So take it with a grain of salt, but if you had a, uh, almost a blank check, and I'll start with you, Bo, of to spend more money to make your environments safer and more effective. Where would you be spending money if, if you could? And again, I'll stay with you, Bo. Well, I think the, the recent studies showed that about 60% of all the uh, schools in America need to update their HVAC systems. And uh, uh, my school system is one that we have already, we started a plan uh, talking about that two years ago. Uh, there's this so much more technology that can, uh, better for the uh, the airflow and the circulation of fresh air uh, with the new systems in HVAC. Uh, that's probably where I'd start more than, more than anywhere else. Uh, being able to control something like we can control and that would be our HVAC. Uh, you know, having a blank check, that would be nice, but we know that 
that's not, you know, that's not going to, it's not yeah, possible. It's not. And, and again, that's, and that's why I say take it with a grain of salt. Obviously. But like I said, though, but you know, the thing is we've, uh, we've done everything we possibly can to keep our students and our staff safe, but I would definitely start with the HVAC systems and yeah. all the buildings. Let me go to you, Ted, and the same question, and, and I'll add on the question, you have a high school under construction. Have you made changes to those plans and to that construction given COVID? And we all hope there's not a COVID 20 or 21 or 22, but this could happen again. And so how have you maybe changed things at the construction site? Well, the, the, the short answer on that is we really didn't have the opportunity to make changes um, without significantly slowing down the project. Uh, you know, we are, uh, fortunately, our buildings are newer, so we haven't had to struggle with some of the HVAC issues, I think, that uh, some of our, you know, partner systems have had. Um, it, you know, to answer your question about where additional funds could be used, like most things in education, it really comes down to, to people. I think if, if we had more bodies in the building. And that's one thing we've spent CARES Act money on. You know, the name of the game is really making smaller groups of students. So there's less uh, or fewer opportunities for contact. In some cases, we have extra classrooms to put students in, but we don't have the teachers to staff those extra classrooms. So one of the things that we've done is we've used the other uh, kind of areas in our building to spread students out, but typically they're being supervised by large groups of students supervised by fewer people, which is uh, also gives them fewer opportunities for that direct kind of support yeah. and instruction. So really, we'd, we'd, if we had more money, uh, we'd probably, first of all, pay the people we've got more because they're working harder than I've ever seen a group of people work. Uh, yeah. And second, we'd probably get more people just to help. Yeah, yeah and I see Bo uh, uh, nodding his head to that. A quick question for both of you all, and then I'll go back to Bill. And I don't want to be coy about this. Um, and I also don't want to put either of you in a bad spot. So bear with me. SCS, Shelby County Schools, has obviously been doing purely virtual learning. And um, they have announced uh, that they're going to go back into some form of in-person um, in January. And obviously, they have, a you know, what, some 90,000 students. Um, it's a massive, massive school system. Um, one thing they've talked about, and there's been a little bit of pushback on from parents. And again, all this is early. And you all don't have any decision-making part of that, your separate school system. Um, they're doing. Um, uh, they're talking about doing some amount of bringing the kids into the classroom, but having a teacher on a screen, um, and it's not unprecedented. Other school systems and schools around the country have done that. Have, I'll start. I'll stay with you, Ted. Have you done any of that kind of teaching? Where, for whatever reason, maybe you have a teacher who's high risk. Then, for whatever reason, have you put teachers on the screen for in-person students, and how has that gone? Uh, the only situation in which we've done that is even though we have not had but but one uh, faculty case, we have had a number of situations where uh, teachers or staff had to had to quarantine or be in isolation um, because of a potential contact. And in a very limited number of cases, those teachers, while they were quarantining from home, would telework and would uh, we would we, put them into into the classroom. But it's been sure. very very limited. Uh, how how did it go? Uh, well, in this particular situation, it was a younger students, so there were uh, assistants in the room that gotcha. were able to kind of fill in the gap. It was a pretty limited kind of experiment. It, for, for us, it was not something we would want to do on a, on a large scale or uh, Fair enough. very many yeah. cases. That's yeah, it. and Bo, same question to you. Have, you. have you done any of that by choice or by sort of necessity, as Ted just described? Well, under, underneath our plan with it be the hybrid or being the full virtual on Friday, all our teachers, we have no students on campus uh, except for our, our special needs students uh, because they do have to go five days a week because of their educational needs. Uh, but on Friday, our, our team, uh, we use our team learning and our team uh, video conferencing with our teachers to, to check in with our students. Uh, it's been uh, something brand new. Uh, they're getting better at it every day. Uh, but they do that every Friday. We've had to have, just like Dr. Hoyle and other school districts, with, you know, uh, teachers being quarantined. Uh, we've had staff members having to be quarantined. Uh, but we use the virtual on Friday. That way, if we do have another situation where the school districts uh, have to shut down like we did in the spring, uh, we'll be ready for that. But I do feel like uh, we are ready for that because of the great uh, – work done by our central office staff and our leaders in that because every one of our students do have a one-on-one -on -one device. We were very fortunate in that. Mr. Matt Bowser and technology got those ordered and we were one of the very first schools in the nation to get all our computers. That was great. But, you know, just like uh, Dr. Horrell and municipalities and the private schools and charter schools and Shelby County schools, I do think every uh, superintendent or director of schools is doing 
what they think is best in their situation for their students. I have no doubt that everyone's doing what they feel is safe and best for their students at this time. Yeah, yeah. Let me go to Bill. Ted, the uh, the governor has announced that that the achievement test, I'll call it that generically, the, the achievement test that students take will will not be used uh, for for evaluation purposes of where students are and how effective teachers are uh, during during at least this this particular school year. H having said that, though, where where do you see student achievement as being under these very unusual and very stressful circumstances for your students? Sure, and our, our school board passed a resolution urging the legislature to, uh, to, to cancel the testing overall and certainly not have accountability um, this year. Um, on the other hand, I know the data would be, would, would be useful and may be useful if that's the direction they go in terms of trying to benchmark and figure out what impact uh, this, this style of teaching had. Um, I've been really, really just kind of amazed and impressed by the quality and level of teaching <laughs> that I've seen in the classrooms, both for our students that are learning from home and the ones that are in person. Um, even in the situations where the students are only in actual classrooms three days a week, like the middle school, I think they've, they've actually benefited from the smaller grouping and anecdotally, the teachers have said that, you know, they like having those smaller class sizes and maybe are, are, are more effective during those three days a week than they would be with bigger classes five days a week in some cases. So uh, I, I'm hoping and I'm optimistic that the overall impact on our students would, would be minimal um, because I think we did continue with learning to a certain extent during the spring, but definitely hit the ground running um, on August 10th and, and opened on time uh, with as many in-person students as, uh, as wanted to be here. And I, I, I'm optimistic it's made a difference for the students. Mm -hmm. Bo, where do you think your, your, your students are? I mean, this is pretty complicated for, for kids to have to go through and adults as, as well. Um, are you concerned that they might be losing some ground here? Well, yes, sir, I am concerned because, you know, one of the things that uh, we've seen was that uh, I, we're getting our latest, we do a lot of uh, uh, data checks and we do a lot of assessing of our students to see where they're at because we can't fix a problem until we know where the problem is or where the problem lies. Uh, one of the aspects is that uh, a lot of our students, they, when we first tested them, yes, their reading levels were a little lower than we expected. However, uh, I've noticed now that we got them back in the routine and we really hadn't lost that knowledge, we just lost the routine. Uh, students are amazing to me, like Dr. Horrell says and our teachers, once they get back in the routine of reading, writing, or arithmetic, it, it is amazing how they can bounce back. Uh, I'm very excited that the governor stood up for the educators in this regard because one of the aspects is that we got to realize too is that our students have never been through a pandemic. They've never had a major situation like this in their life. So, you know, the social, the mental well-being of our students is very important right now. Uh, a lot of our students, you know, school is their safe place. This is where they come to get away from their problems. And uh, I knew it was going to be difficult because like for elementary teachers, you know, they're, they're huggers. I mean, they love to hug their kids and they can't, they can't do that now. And it's really tough. Uh, but just having that face, they know their familiar face, that teacher that really cares about them showing uh, they love them every day and being there for them has made a big difference. Uh, I'm hoping very optimistic that our scores will be, uh, where they need to be. They may be a little lower. However, uh, you know, I was excited about the testing last year and we didn't get the opportunity to do that because of the things we had put into place that shown that our kids were improving uh, with their with their skills. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let me just with a couple minutes left here, I'll, I'll go to you, Ted, and 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 touch on something that Bo just touched on. That I mean, schools again, we obviously first and foremost are places for education, but they are also, um, I mean, for many kids, they are a form of a safety net. Right. And I think you and I have had that conversation before about the, you all provide a lot of of social services, as it were, and, you know, counseling and, and things outside reading, writing and arithmetic. Um, have you been able to continue to provide those services? And have you seen an uptick in this is a very stressful time? And, and as I think you both have said, particularly for little kids, they don't fully understand all these restrictions and these masks. They don't have the full concept on it. What have you seen on that front, kind of the whole child mental health aspects? 
Yeah, that's a great question. It certainly was a big part of what drove our decision to to proceed. I mean, we 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 went into this like everybody else. We weren't sure if it was going to work or if we were going to be contributing to, you know, putting kids in in harm's way in terms of their health. We knew we had we thought we had a pretty good plan and a good chance of keeping them safe. But uh, we do think that in person learning is a better opportunity to connect with those kids. I'd say what we've seen overall is that when they are when there are situations that that we have even in a normal year with kids in terms of mental health. It, it's just, it's probably exponentially kind of compounded um, because of the situation. There's just more factors at play in terms of stressors at home uh, for the parents and things. So uh, we, it's definitely something that we've had to had to keep an eye on. Um, but, but to be fair, um, a lot of those situations, they've been rising in recent years anyway. I just think kids are under more stress and pressure um, than they ever have been. And this, this pandemic certainly hasn't helped. Yeah, yeah. It, last word to you, Bo, I mean, similar, uh, I mean, have you seen a, an increase in just these non-academic, these, these challenges, the mental health, broadly speaking, challenges that students can face given all the stress? I mean, you've got parents who've lost jobs or have job uncertainty. I mean, it's just, it's just a, a horrible situation. Oh, absolutely, Eric. I think you've hit it on, uh, on the head of the nail right there is that you know, our students have seen things they have never seen before. You know, mom and dad, um, you know, losing jobs, you know, living day to day. Uh, we actually... Uh, took on another role, but we hired another social worker. We now have two. We've made more home visits, uh, of course, being socially distant, uh, checking up on those students. Uh, we served over 140,000 meals this summer alone for our students, uh, just to make sure that they were taken care of. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, our, our number one priority is, is to take care of our kids. It doesn't matter if they're in the building or outside of the building. And uh, I take that very, very seriously, like all my uh, colleagues in that. And, because we, if our kids don't feel, if they don't feel safe, if they're hungry, they're not going to learn. And that's one thing we, we have always been from the start is that kids come first in Millington and we will continue that. All right. Well, we will leave it there. Thank you both for uh, joining us. Thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you for watching. Uh, again, remember, you can get past episodes of all our shows on the WKNO.org website, including conversations with other superintendents from all the local school systems uh, that we've done over the last month. Um, you, or you can download the full podcast of the show from the Daily Memphian site or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.